Good evening, everybody. Hope you're having a good evening so far. I'm glad to have you here this evening. Um, first of all, I want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. So if someone can type in the chat box and just let me know you're here, say hi, hello. Um, and just let me know that everything's working okay and that um, you can hear me. So I'll give it a minute here because I know there's a little bit of a delay. Thanks, Dorothy. Hi, how are you doing? Great to see you here this evening. I appreciate that. So I'll just give everybody just another minute to get on the call. Hi, Sherry. I know it's warmer where you guys are right now. It was not too bad here in Colorado today. We got up into the mid 60s, but um, there's a big snowstorm coming in from what I hear. Okay, so I think we're going to get going and so as not to distract uh, everybody with my face in the little box in the corner, I'm going to turn the camera off and we're going to get started for this evening. So um, first of all, I'm just glad you're all here this evening for this very important topic, Candida Health Dangers You Need to Know. This is a topic near and dear to my heart of which I will be sharing more about with you shortly. So to get started, I just want to first of all say welcome to everybody for being here. Um, I appreciate you taking the time. I know your time's valuable, but over the next hour, I'm going to be sharing um, some very important information with you about candida overgrowth and also some natural ways to help heal your gut. So my goal here is that by the end of the webinar that you will have a better understanding of how candida may be impacting your health and what you should look for and ways you can start to combat it. Of course, I need to give my loving disclaimer that the information I am about to share with you is for educational and information purposes only and is not a replacement for seeking appropriate medical care. Um, and please feel free to, you know, say hi to each other, um, talk to each other in the chat box, because, you know, if this is something you feel that you're suffering from, there's likely other people on this webinar tonight are thinking the same thing, and that's, you know, likely while you're here. Um, I'm also going to be taking questions at the end. So if you have any, please hold those until then, and I will be more than happy to answer them. And if you're afraid of forgetting, you know, maybe a question that you have, just write it down. And that's the other thing that I would suggest. You may want to take some notes uh, this evening. So grab a piece of paper and a pen and um, do that right now if you want to. I just don't want you to miss anything that um, is important. It's all important and valuable, but um, there may be some definite notes that you're going to want to take with tonight's webinar. Um, to start off, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Laura Dankoff. I am a functional medicine nurse practitioner. And here I am with my two lovely daughters. I have been in practice for many years and functional medicine has been a big part of my practice as long as I have been a nurse practitioner. Recently, I moved from the middle of the country, Iowa to Colorado and started a telemedicine or virtual health consulting practice. So now I'm seeing people virtually and sometimes in person as well. And this allows me to reach more people um, that are really needing the help of a functional medicine practitioner. And one of the reasons I am so passionate about functional medicine and the topic of candida tonight has to do with our youngest daughter, the one you see there on the left. You see, she was born with a blood um, disorder that was hereditary. And by the age of seven, she was having her spleen and her gallbladder removed. Um, she was very ill the first several years of her life. And the treatment for her blood disorder 
um, when things got to such a state of, you know, really compromising her life in essence was to remove her spleen. And that is what um, needed to happen. There's no doubt about it that with the condition that she had known as congenital spherocytosis. Um, but the consequence of that also was the recommendation was to put um, anybody that had their spleen removed, particularly at that young of an age, was to put them on antibiotics every day, we were told, until the age of 21. Well, you can imagine, knowing what we know now, how crazy that sounds. And needless to say, um, within a few years, taking those antibiotics every day pretty much wiped out any beneficial or good bacteria in her gut and how her yeast overgrowth uh, developed or manifested was she developed a raging case of eczema, a skin condition. And I, you know, instantly knew, I knew more than, um, I was early on into my um, nursing career um, when she was having all these health issues. And, you know, like everybody, I did what the doctor told me to do. You know, this was her life and, you know, we did the best we could. But once I realized what was going on, I went to her hematologist, blood doctor, the skin doctor. Um, the blood doctor told me to put her right back on those antibiotics in, in spite of the fact she was having this confirmed case of yeast overgrowth on her skin and the dermatologist wanted to put her on um, an immunomodulating agent that would further suppress her immune system. At that point in time, I knew I had to take matters into my own hands as her mother and sought out the treatment of alternative therapies and natural medicine and that is what healed her and we put the antibiotics in the cupboard and the rest is history. Here she is a beautiful young woman today, soon to be married, which we're very proud of her and her older sister there as well. So as you can see, this is certainly a subject I have personally been through myself with my own family. And it's um, one that's highly unrecognized by um, conventional medicine, except in some common cases or extreme cases, which we're going to get into this evening. So now that you know a bit about my story, I think it's important for you to understand what a functional medicine approach to care means in case this is a new concept to you, as this will give you a better understanding of what working with a functional practitioner may look like and why this approach to healthcare is different than what you may be used to. And I think it's important to give this foundational information because what I'm, else I'm gonna share with you tonight will then make more sense. As a functional practitioner, I'm going to look at your unique and complex mix of interactions between the environment and what you're eating and your stress level and your physical activity and how all this together impacts your health, not just of what's maybe going on in your life now, but what happened throughout your life to bring you to the point in time that you are currently in and maybe suffering from. And it's certainly not giving you a pill for every ill. So if you're not familiar with the uh, term functional medicine, basically functional medicine is often referred to as the future of healthcare, and I truly believe that. Yet for many, it's still an unknown concept. What sets this type of practice apart from the conventional healthcare provided today is it's a more personalized approach to care that focuses on the causes of your discomfort versus just your symptoms. Now, keep in mind, we need conventional health care. It's great with acute care, not great with um, chronic health conditions. And certainly if, you know, we're all in a car accident, heaven forbid, you know, we want to go to the emergency room. In America, we're very good at trauma and acute care. But where we're failing is in this area of chronic unknown conditions or things that don't fit into the traditional medical model. So functional medicine is guided by some key principles. We are all unique individuals with varying needs based on our genetics, our environment, and unique health history. Therefore, your care should be very individualized. 
In order to do that, it is important that I, as a clinician, first listen to your story. This is so important, as this will be the guiding post to getting to the root cause and will direct the path to helping you to heal. This means taking a very holistic approach to treatment that is focused on the root cause of each issue rather than simply treating the symptoms of the disease or condition. Functional medicine is revolutionizing the medical field by empowering you, the patient, to better understand the imbalances in your body and how these imbalances are affecting your health. And it offers solutions um, not previously available to you where it really puts you in control of your health. Above all, all the functional medicine field helps redefine how we think of disease by providing a more productive framework to achieve optimal health. It is meant to help you improve your quality of life by making step-by-step -step changes. Okay, now that we've got that foundation um, down, let's dive into tonight's topic, candida, and what candida is. Our bodies host a variety of organisms, including bacteria and fungus. Candida is a species of yeast and is normally found in small amounts in the mouth, the digestive tract, and the skin. When present in small amounts, the body can still thrive and do fine. However, in the right environment, like what happened to my daughter, yeast can multiply and grow out of control and lead to a condition called candidiasis. According to the Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention, there are over 20 species of candida yeast that can cause infection in humans, the most common of which is candida albicans, and this is widely um, supported and recognized by conventional medicine as well. But there are, what we're going to find out, other types of candida as well. So the three main types of candida that are commonly recognized are candida infections of the mouth, the throat, and the esophagus. This is called thrush or oropharyngeal candidiasis. There are vaginal candidiasis, commonly known as vaginal yeast infections, which most, I think maybe 75% of women, they say, or more actually experience it sometime in their life. And then this, the most severe case um, is invasive candidiasis, which occurs when candida species enter the bloodstream and spread throughout the body. So some common species of candida include the candida albicans, candida tropicalis, candida glabrata, and others. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a closer look at some of these various forms of candida and also what type of symptoms you may experience with some of these forms of candida as well. So starting off with the most common, which occurs in 50% of the cases, is candida albicans. It's an opportunistic in nature, meaning this yeast will seize the opportunity to overgrow and wreak havoc in various parts of your body. The environments in which candida albicans thrive include a compromised immune system, low counts of beneficial bacteria due to antibiotic use, high stress, excessive sugar intake, hormone imbalances, and exposure to environmental toxins and pollutants and their effect on the gut microbiome. Now, what you may not realize or hear in just that one statement is that these are the modern day stressors or risks to all of us. You know, there's an overuse of antibiotics. We're all under lots of stress. There's lots of hidden sugars in the food supply. All of this then creates hormone imbalances and you throw in all the environmental pollutants and toxins that we're regularly being exposed to. And this messes up our gut microbiome. And this also opens up the opportunity for this particular yeast and others to proliferate. So untreated candida albicans overgrowth can lead to, um, in severe cases, systemic infections into the bloodstream, creating an environment that's, um, you know, more conducive to other diseases developing. 
Um, there are many common symptoms people can experience with candida albicans or yeast overgrowth. So I'm going to go over some of those symptoms now. And I want you to listen to these because my guess is there's a good chance you may have one or many of these symptoms if you feel like you might have yeast overgrowth. And these include fatigue, bloating, gas, anxiety, depression, vaginitis, itchy skin, impaired memory, poor concentration, foggy brain, sleep issues. Do you, does any of this sound familiar? If you have one or many of these symptoms, I'm not saying you have yeast overgrowth, but you may have yeast overgrowth if you have um, some of these symptoms. So next I want to talk about Candida tropicalis. It is the second most common species and is believed to be responsible for up to 30% of Candida bloodstream infections. Overgrowth of this species has also been linked with nervous system disorders resulting in depression, anxiety, headaches, and memory loss. Individuals most susceptible to this type of overgrowth include people with diabetes, leukemias, lymphomas, and yet, in other words, people whose immune systems are greatly compromised. And this type of overgrowth usually occurs in the gastrointestinal tract and on the skin. Common um, side effects from this overgrowth can include diarrhea, excessive gas, stomach cramps, and skin irritations, including relentless itching, eczema, and hives. This species of candida is becoming more resistant to antifungal drugs, making it more difficult to treat. And this is the scary thing that I have seen a trend of, given that I do do a functional diagnostic stool testing in people, and we can sometimes look to see what uh, antifungals a person will respond to and also what herbal ones people will respond to. And what I have seen is whenever that uh, has been looked at is that these cases are resistant to diflucan or fluconazole, which is widely used and has been for some time for yeast infections. And this is a scary thing because um, this is the first go-to um, us practitioners often will use to address a yeast um, infection in a woman. It's not unusual for that to be the thing to go to where actually it may just be suppressing things. And then as soon as you stop the uh, antifungal, it comes back out to play. So this is something to pay attention to and why it... Um, isn't my main go-to anymore, um, and I use other things instead. All right, so um, according to the National Health Institute's mucosal and systemic infections, um, such as this poor woman here, are caused by Candida glabrata. This type of Candida has increased significantly due to the growing use of immunosuppressant um, agents. This species is responsible for about 10 to 30 percent of candida infections and can cause oral thrush, which is like a yeast infection in the mouth. And thrush can affect anyone. However, it's most frequent among babies, toddlers, older adults, and people with immune deficiencies. Left untreated, thrush can spread to other parts of the body, including the lungs and the liver of those who are immunocompromised. You didn't know there were so many forms of candida, did you? <laughs> so next up is candida parapsilosis, and it's involved in about 30% of candida infections, including nail and tissue infections, as well as fungal blood infections. Symptoms are most common among Im immune impaired people and can include severe flu-like symptoms, chronic fatigue, and systemic infections. These species have a high resistance rate to, um, as well and are a great concern 
uh, in European hospitals currently. All right, here's a couple of other species that are less common that you can see there. Um, the first one is associated with infant diarrhea and sometimes a systemic candidiasis. And the second one is a pretty significant one. This is um, where you get something called uh, candidemia in severe cases. It's kind of like getting sepsis, which sepsis is a blood infection that is quite serious and can be life-threatening. Um, so this can result in sepsis. It can result in pyelonephritis, which is a potentially serious uh, kidney infection. So these are just some of the 20 identifiable species of candida. So now let's look at what causes candida overgrowth. There are many reasons yeast can grow out of control in the body, such as taking antibiotics, such as happened to my poor daughter. She was on them for several years. I want to say she was probably on them about five years when all of this kind of blew up in our faces. Um, it can also be due to eating a high uh, sugar, refined carb diet, drinking too much alcohol, having a weakened immune system. Um, many don't realize, but taking birth control pills or oral contraceptives can be a risk having diabetes, and having high levels of chronic stress. And how many people do you know, maybe yourself included in that, that have suffered from prolonged stress? And the reason that stress is a huge risk is because any amount of stress, particularly when it's chronic long-term stress, it lowers what's known as immunoglobulin A in the digestive tract. And that therefore lowers the immunity in the digestive tract where a lot of this is stemming from. And this gives that yeast an opportunity to overgrow as well. Um, so trying to manage our stress is certainly a big deal. So our gut health is a major, major influencer on various illnesses. I always say the gut is the epicenter to our health and that's so true. So let's take a look at what it means to have a healthy gut microbiome. This is the good versus bad bacteria in your gut. Um, so we're going to look at ways how we can lower our risk of yeast overgrowth from occurring and also ways to try to start the healing process, particularly if you feel you are currently suffering from this. So let's take a look, closer look first at the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome this is all these bacteria in our guts. There are over a hundred trillion good bacteria living in our bodies, most of which can be found in the gut. In fact, our gut is swarming with all sorts of microbes and various um, bacteria. A healthy gut has a balance of good to bad bacteria. The good guys are the beneficial bacteria that help enhance our health and keep us well, um, sort of like a probiotic does. You know, that's where we're replacing some of that good bacteria. And it should also be noted that a healthy balance is uh, of good to bad bacteria is 85% good to about 15% bad. The beneficial bacteria is needed to help the body break down food and to absorb our nutrients. So we really need these guys here. However, when our gut is out of balance, the bad bacteria coming from various sources such as food, environmental toxins, the antibiotics, other medications and stress, this, they, like I said, they take advantage and these bad bacteria multiply quickly, causing harm to the body potentially. And this is certainly what happened in my daughter's case and we were on a crusade to heal her gut essentially. So as I mentioned earlier, there are many signs your body may be suffering from candida. So here are some more things to look at or just for review as before. So one of the big ones I see and really am suspicious that somebody's got a yeast overgrowth is they have persistent and intense sugar cravings. And the reason for that is these yeast thrive off of sugar and want to be fed. And so they're going to make you crave them even more, which is just a cruel 
terrible joke, but it's the truth. Um, you're also going to crave a lot of processed carbs, such as bread and pasta and pastries. You're likely to experience brain fog, anxiety, depression, mood swings, and irritability. You may or may not have vaginal yeast infection. So if you don't have that, the, the, uh, you know, the wrong thing to think of is that, well, I've never had a yeast infection, so I can't possibly have yeast overgrowth. There's plenty of people who have yeast overgrowth that never have vaginal yeast infections. Um, you can have poor focus and concentration. You likely will have developed other food uh, sensitivities or intolerances. You might have a white coating on your tongue, and you're going to possibly experience digest digestive issues like gas and bloating, constipation, diarrhea, or mucus in your stools. You might have skin issues like acne, eczema, or psoriasis. You could have itchy ears, low libido, unexplained fatigue and exhaustion. Um, you can have skin and nail fungal infections, canker sores, flu-like symptoms, and chronic, chronic sinus infections. Um, so as you can see here, there are a wide variety of symptoms that can occur. I have never seen anyone with just one symptom, but more likely than not, will have several symptoms um, that I mentioned. And I just want to kind of step back a minute to the chronic sinus infections. This is something that is often overlooked, and I remember reading a study uh, several years ago from the Mayo Clinic where they actually said that, I want to say it was 90 or 99 percent, it was a high percentage of chronic sinus issues were due to uh, um, yeast infections, fungal overgrowths. And what do most people get for their chronic sinus issues? They tend to get antibiotics. Well, what are the antibiotics going to do? They're going to further feed the sinus infections. And this is a hard one because um, if they want to confirm that these chronic sinus infections are due to a fungus, it's a rather invasive procedure to try to get a, um, a culture from your sinuses. And my approach to this has been, if I have somebody coming to see me that has chronic sinus issues, I'm going to be highly suspicious that they may well have uh, candida in their body. And I will trial them on an antifungal that concentrates well in the gut to help with the gut healing. And... Um, Lo and behold, often these people, their sinuses can start clearing up and they start feeling better. Now, is this true in every case? I Probably not, but it very well could be true in a lot of cases. And it is certainly worth trying to see if it doesn't help a person. So that's my two cents on uh, chronic, chronic sinus issues. Well, now let's take a closer look at some common conditions which are associated with candida. First of all is oral thrush, which is the yeast overgrowth in the mouth. And this can cause a white bumpy lesions. It can cause redness and pain in the mouth and the throat. And in severe cases can spread to the esophagus and cause pain or difficulty swallowing. Having a weakened immune system is commonly associated with oral thrush. You can have tiredness and fatigue. I mean, there's so many reasons we can be tired and fatigued, but this is certainly one of many reasons. It's a, among the most common symptoms uh, for several reasons that this is a common symptom with candida overgrowth because it's going to contribute to nutritional deficiencies such as vitamin B6, and essential fatty acids, and magnesium usually accompany a candida infection. Again, a compromised immune system can also impair this. So now this is one people really don't think much of, and this is where antibiotics get overused again. And this is in reoccurring genital and urinary tract infections. While men can get yeast infections, it is much less common than the estimated 75% of women who experience at least one vaginal yeast infection in their lifetime requiring um, 
uh, with reoccurring infections from candida. But what I want to say about the urinary piece of this is um, I've had a, a few cases where I have had women who have suffered from interstitial cystitis, which is a terrible painful, irritating kind of bladder spasms, overactive bladder, frequent urination. And I've had um, a gentleman that had chronic prostatitis at a young age. And in these cases, they got so many antibiotics. And I thought to myself, you know, yeast is a very irritating thing. Candida is a very irritating thing. It, could it be that what they actually have is a fungal overgrowth. And so we approached it from that standpoint and lo and behold, their symptoms greatly, greatly improved. And in fact, would go away um, at times. So this is another area where this may be something to consider if you are suffering from these kinds of issues. Also digestive issues, when the balance of good and bad bacteria is impaired, you can experience digestive issues like constipation, diarrhea, nausea, gas, cramping, and bloating. I mentioned the chronic sinus infections um, definitely can be a factor. And then skin and nail uh, fungal infections. Skin is naturally covered with bacteria to prevent candida from overgrowing uncontrollably. However, many products we put on our skin can um, enhance the opportunity for candida, such as antibacterial soaps would be a perfect example of this because we're washing off um, some of the good bacteria pr that's protecting us. We may also experience itching and you may have a rash. I've seen people with raging skin infections or not skin infection, but raging skin rashes and they've been to the dermatologist and nobody can seem to figure out what's going on. So they put them on all these antihistamines and topical steroids and never think that maybe what's going on in their gut could be a factor and maybe could be a yeast overgrowth. All right, so research has found that an overgrowth of candida is associated with several diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. This includes leaky gut syndrome, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and I would even suspect, as I mentioned, interstitial cystitis and chronic prostatitis. Though this is only my opinion and observation, research has also been shown that it's associated with eczema, fibromyalgia, and even cancer. So researchers have known for years now that bacteria and viral infections cause several types of cancers. Current research is examining the link between cancer and fungal overgrowth, and many believe there is a connection between the two. One of the first that I ever heard of this connection was um, a woman by the name of Hilda Clark. She's actually written several books on this subject and the link. Now, uh, Nobel laureate Dr. Johannes Fibiger of Denmark proved the connection actually between cancer and fungal growth when he fed parasitic larvae carrying cockroaches uh, to healthy rats in 1913. I know it sounds exciting, right? A comprehensive study published in 1950 also at Lacanau Hospital Research Institute and the Institute for Cancer Research revealed findings of fungi present in virtually all cancerous tumors they examined. Why aren't we hearing about this? You know, why, why is this not something being considered by our oncologist? The coexistence of cancer and candidiasis has been well documented over the years. In fact, Dr. Tulio Simonici, author of Cancer is a Fungus, points out that at the most basic level, cancer and yeast fungi have very similar, if not, this is just shocking to me, identical characteristics. What he found was both cancer and candida feed on sugar. And this is always something, you know, 
if uh, you or someone you know suffers has suffered from cancer and they go and hopefully they're changing this but you would go in and they would get their chemo treatments or whatever and there'd be a bowl of candy there I mean this is crazy another characteristic is that both grow and reproduce only in anaerobic or low oxygen environments both need an acidic environment to survive so what's an acidic environment so that can be an unhealthy diet full of processed foods and sugars so when you probe a cancer cell within the human body they appear white in color and uneven in texture just like yeast dr simoncini stated that candida is found and get this about 97 to 98 percent of the cases of cancerous tumors in humans this is crazy this all begs the question if this should not be considered more seriously in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer but it is certainly beyond my level of knowledge or expertise but i just found that kind of shocking and fascinating all at the same time so let's talk a little bit more about candida and sugar. So candida albicans in particular has a high affinity for glucose, meaning candida organisms need sugar like glucose and fructose and sucrose to provide them with energy to grow. Additionally, sugar enables the candida yeast cells to switch to their more destructive fungal form. This results in faster growing candida leading to things such as leaky gut syndrome which that's a big problem today for a lot of us. And I could go into a whole nother uh, hour just talking about leaky gut syndrome. So some researchers firmly believe the rise of cancer rates over the last 80 years could be due to the modern car carbohydrate rich diet, processed white sugar, refined flour, high fructose corn syrup, and other foods with high glycemic counts, meaning high blood sugar counts to feed this yeast fungus causing it to grow rapidly this leads to the disruption in the normal healthy balance of the good and the bad flora lowering your immune response so we know that yeast overgrowth is linked to poor immune function when combined with increases in refined sugar consumption. It's no wonder we are so sick. There are so many hidden sugars hidden in foods today that should not be there and it's highly addictive. You know, in Europe, there's so many foods that don't have colorings, additives, and added sugar in it. But in this country, it makes people say addicted to foods. I mean, it's great for the food industry, right? Now, this next point is important. Um, all of this is important, but this next point is important. In 20, a 2011 study found that carbohydrates were indispensable both for cellular growth and for the transition into fungal form. Depriving the candida of its food source can slow its growth and prevent the transition from happening. This means reducing sugar intake can drastically improve our overall gut health. Makes sense, right? So let's take a look at other methods of correcting candida next. So I hope you're taking good notes. So certainly diet is a surefire way to improve um, conditions in our gut. Experts in digestive health like Lisa Richards and Dr. Eric Wood, who authored the Ultimate Candida Diet Program, which provides a number of recommended foods to eat and avoid to help combat candida. So here are some of the foods that you want to eat to lower the risk of this candida overgrowth in your body. First of all, starting with non-starchy vegetables, things like artichokes, broccoli, celery, eggplant, kale, onions, spinach, and zucchini. Now, of course, we want to make, think, make sure all of these are organic and natural. Um, don't have a lot of pesticides and herbicides and things like that wrecking havoc. You want to uh, consume lower sugar fruits like avocados, lemons, limes, and olives. And non-glutinous grains like buckwheat, an oat bran, quinoa, millet, and teff. Choose healthy proteins like eggs, 
herring and wild salmon. And if you're not uh, lactose intolerant, some people actually can do things like kefir and organic Greek yogurt because these contain natural probiotics. And then low mold nuts and seeds such as almonds, flaxseed, hazelnuts, and some great spices and condiments such as apple cider vinegar with mother, the, the organic, I like the Bragg's apple cider vinegar with mother, basil, cloves, um, certainly garlic, paprika, and rosemary. And then healthy fats such as flax, oil, olive oil, sesame oil, extra virgin coconut oil. These are all good. Natural sweeteners you can use are stevia and erythritol. And some fermented foods such as kefir, olives, and sauerkraut. The sauerkraut needs to be organic. It needs to be in the refrigerator section or better yet, make your own. And even chicory coffee and herbal teas. So those are some great food sources. Now, there are also foods you want to avoid, particularly during the time that you are trying to heal from a yeast overgrowth because there are some fruits that you're going to want to avoid during this time because they are even though fruits are great um, you may want to avoid uh, these particular ones because they have a higher sugar content such as dates and fruit juice and grapes and even bananas but at the same time bananas are a great prebiotic so a small amount a serving a banana might be okay but during the early stages, you probably want to avoid it when you're trying to heal from this. And then you want to avoid gluten-containing grains such as barley, wheat, and rye, and meats like pork and certainly lunch meat, and uh, tuna and swordfish. They're really high in heavy metals, and a lot of times heavy metals are kind of hiding out where yeast and parasites might be hiding out. And um, certainly uh, milk and cheese products because cheese is a you know a mold basically and moldy nuts and seeds and certainly sugar refined and processed vegetable oils um, caffeinated and sugary drinks and alcohol so those are ones to avoid okay let's talk about uh, a candida cleanse this was actually um, put together by Dr. Josh Axe. He's well-known functional medicine chiropractor. He's all over the internet. He sells products and so forth. But he offers two methods for doing a candida cleanse, which can help the body get rid of excess candida by flushing, out, flushing it out of the digestive tract. So please note these are only starting points because my experience is this stuff can really be hard to eradicate and can come back easily and you always kind of have to be mindful and working at it. So his first option is doing a liquid only cleanse and basically what you're going to do is you make a vegetable broth from organic onions, garlic, celery, kale, sea salt like preferably Himalayan sea salt and water. So you make this vegetable broth and for one to two days you drink only the broth and lots of water throughout the day. And this can be repeated every few weeks or as a jump start op uh, to option two. So again those are onions and garlic, celery, kale, sea salt and water and you make this broth and what, basically what you're doing is you're starving the yeast. And then another option or option two, which you can do after this, after you do the, the vegetable broth, or you could do this in place of the vegetable broth for about three to five days, is eliminate sugars, fruits, starches, alcohol from your diet. You will be eating mostly steamed vegetables and be drinking lots of waters, and you want to avoid starchy vegetables, which may contribute to sugar levels and feed the candida. So you want to avoid um, things like carrots, radishes, beets, and sweet potatoes and white potatoes. Um, bitter greens topped with coconut oil and apple cider vinegar are also recommended as well. So bitters um, would be things like um, um, collard greens and cilantro and things like that. But like I said, this is only just a little jump start. This is hardly going to eradicate uh, a yeast overgrowth if you have it. 
So next up, and hopefully you're taking good notes, we're going to go over um, um, anti antifungal drugs um, that can be used and also go through the four R's and so forth um, that are, we use in functional medicine to approach any kind of healing process. So the four R's for candida following a functional medicine approach. We're going to look at trying to uncover, first of all, your health issues, your nutritional needs, any digestive dysfunctions, um, bacterial imbalances to help treat with the yeast. So before I share the four R's with you, if you, if you haven't got that piece of paper yet, go grab it and get ready to write these down. So the first R is remove. We want to eliminate problem foods, toxins, low-grade uh, infections, and oxidative stress. Now, the foods we talked about, the others we, did, uh, we didn't because th these are things that you have to actually test for. So to, de to determine if you have candida or other low-grade infections, there are different ways that you can test for them through blood, stool, doing uh, swabs that you look at things under a micro microscope. Um, I like to use GI map testing. So GI map is a stool test that actually looks at DNA markers in your stool for not only um, candida, uh, and it doesn't check every strain, but it'll check to see, it'll check a about three strains, but it'll also check to see if there's any candida species present in the GI map stool testing. It'll also check to see what your good versus bad bacteria balance is. Remember I talked about we want about 85% good to about 15% bad. It's going to look for parasites um, and viruses. So it's a, a, a very comprehensive test. Um, I know I just got two of these tests back today on a couple of patients and one of them had um, a significant candida overgrowth. So um, I'm always surprised when I get that test back of what is lurking in the gut microbiome. So this is, can be a very valuable tool to help direct care. Um, there have been times I've prophylactically have treated people for a yeast overgrowth, either due to um, financial resources or um, they were just screaming yeast infection. Ideally, you want to test and not guess, but there are times when I may go ahead and treat somebody. So the first step is remove. The second step is replace. So you want to begin re reintroducing a clean diet with essential nutrients your body needs. At this stage, I may well use a prescription antifungal such as nystatin because that concentrates well in the gut. Um, and I would not use fluconazole or itraconazole um, because these one, they're showing a lot of resistance and they're certainly harder on the liver. But nystatin, um, I find is well tolerated and does concentrate in that gut where we need it to. Um, I may also use, you know, different herbals and so forth. And um, there's different ones that can be used. There's oregano and garlic and caprylic acid and uh, paudiarco. And um, so there's a wide variety. So it really kind of depends on the situation. Sometimes I use a homeopathic as well. So step three is repopulate. So we want to repopulate the gut with our healthy bacteria and restore the proper balance of gut floor with um, targeted, sorry, I moved my slide and I shouldn't have, sorry. Uh, repopulate the gut with good bacteria with targeted probiotics and herbals, um, as I mentioned. So a good uh, probiotic uh, here, there's different ones. There are different forms of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium and Saccharomyces boulardii. So when you see all the probiotics out there and it's hard to know what to use, it really is gonna depend on the situation and the tolerability of the person taking the probiotic because you can get really um, lower dose probiotics that have like 5 billion CFUs or colony forming units 
um, up to 50 to 100 billion. Um, but if somebody's guts pretty messed up, I'm I'm more conservative and I'm going to start low and go slow and, and work our way up, but using some targeted probiotics. And then once we've We've cleaned up the terrain with the diet and antifungals through either using nystatin or herbals. I generally using, um, you know, uh, it's a kind of like a six month regimen. A lot of times between the um, antifungals that I use to try to help clean up that terrain and also working on repopulating that good bacteria. So once we've done all that, we want to start doing some repair things. Um, we want to replace your digestive enzyme and use gut healing supplements to help further support the uh, and promote a healthy immune system in the gut and, and aid that whole healing process. So the four R's are an effective way to help address any kind of gastrointestinal dysfunction, um, and that is including candida as well. So now we'll move on to the coconut oil <laughs> that I was on earlier. So there are several approaches one can do to cleaning up the microbiome terrain using supplements, essential oils, and coconut oil. So coconut oil contains lauric acid and caprylic acid and can effectively kill off harmful candida. So how would you um, take that? What you want to do is um, you can add it in a smoothie. Some people take it straight. Um, so there's different ways you can do it. You can do it in a tablet form. And what this does is coconut oil and the lauric acid and caprylic acid, they, these are natural antifungals and they also help um, to shed that um, what's known as the biofilm around any kind of uh, fungal or bacteria or parasite. They form these what are known as biofilms and that's that mucus sometimes you can see in stool is it's a protective cover. It's an armor that these these things form. So we're trying to break that down to get through that resistant wall. Milk thistle um, can provide a great cleanse for the liver from medications and environmental toxins and heavy metals. Um, Wendy Myers, who's kind of an expert in the area, you might say, has become an expert in the area of heavy metals, will, will often talk about how these uh, will lurk inside of yeast and parasites. And so you need to have some sort of a binder um, as you're clearing this out. So binders um, can be things like uh, there's one product called BioCell, uh, which is like silica, and you can get it in drops, and that can act as a binder. Cilantro acts as a binder. Um, so does uh, charcoal and betonite clay. The only thing with those, I always, I, I generally don't recommend people doing those on their own, particularly if you're constipated. We want to get this stuff out of your system so you're not holding on. It may cause a little bit of constipation and you don't want to take them around other supplements or, or medications. Um, also, vitamin C is helpful. It helps boost your immune system. Things such as clove oil and olive oil or oregano oil and myrrh oil. Now, these are great options for killing fungus, including candida in the body, but you need to know what you're doing. These are hot oils and really work with an aromatherapist on this to make sure you're taking them in the right way. Another one is lavender oil. It also can inhibit the growth of, of candida and is also uh, uh, great in preventing the spread of other infections as well. And then probiotic supplements can reduce candida uh, overgrowth and protect against infections. In particular, I like Saccharomyces boulardii. That's um, a form of a probiotic that's been shown to be beneficial when you have a, a yeast overgrowth. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more about the probiotics. So these can help fight candida by restoring the balance of the in the gut, inhibiting this candida from continuing to overgrow and can help maintain your stomach acidity, which we want to get our nutrients. Um, it, that's going to help us break down our food and get our nutrients from our food. So probiotic supplements, as I mentioned, come in different ranges of bacteria. Generally, the higher the count, the better, but a lot of people can't start out there and have to build up to that. So please note that 
Many people with candida infections may not be able to tolerate a probiotic right off the bat, and therefore it is important to work on cleaning up the diet first. And also, um, I like to get the antifungal on board as well to help support to help jumpstart the process. So if I'm doing a yeast cleansing protocol with someone, I'm usually bringing that probiotic in uh, maybe two to four weeks after I, we've already been working on some of this stuff. So furthermore, there are so many probiotics to pick from that sometimes working with a functional practitioner like myself can be helpful in g getting you through that process and making that decision. There are also soil-based probiotics, and these generally have a lower um, count in them, but are more resilient and have better survival rates in the gut as we take the probiotics into our diet. Um, the various strains that you may see are like, and these are ones specific to helping candida, are lactobacillus rhamnosus. I know these words are hard. <laughs> Lactobacillus ruteri, bifidobacterium bifidum, and Saccharomyces boulardii. So these have been well researched and have been shown to enhance immune function and reduce the duration of candida overgrowth. So those are the things you kind of want to look for. All right, so to review the 4R approach with one added step here it, when looking at different ways to address yeast. We wanna look at natural ways. So this is um, just another kind of review or way of looking at natural ways to help with candida. So step one is you wanna starve the yeast by cutting off the sugar and yeast containing foods. That's always gotta be step number one because if I put you on an antifungal or certain probiotics or anything like that, and your diet does not get cleaned up with it, you're really um, going to hit a brick wall and you're not going to make the progress you want to. Step two, you want to break down and kill the yeast overgrowth with natural remedies that I mentioned. And then step three, repopulate the good bacteria with the probiotic supplements and uh, probiotic rich foods. Um, some fermented foods, but you want to bring those in slowly um, because sometimes that will backfire on you if you've got a yeast overgrowth. So you got to be careful with that and start low and slow. You might try some coconut water, um, the sauerkraut, kefir, and kimchi. And then step four is you want to help the body's natural detox defense with liver cleansing supplements, such as I mentioned, like milk thistle. And then the step five here is you got to get plenty of sleep and avoid the unnecessary stress. This may be a good time to try some stress reducing techniques such as deep breathing exercises, getting out and walking, grounding. Grounding is just going out and putting your bare feet on the ground. Um, yoga, meditation. Find five minutes to yourself, even if you have to go lock yourself in the bathroom. Just um, start making steps. Journaling sometimes is a great thing. Um, listening to soft music, whatever you can do, and do it regularly to try to help lower your stress as much as you can. I know it's a challenge in the world we live in today. All right. So I know we've covered a great deal of information tonight. At this time, if you have any questions, I would be happy to take those now. So just type them into the chat box and I will be happy to answer them. And while you're doing that, I am going to put up a link um, for you here. And I have never done this before. Um, and this is a great opportunity if you're new to hearing me tonight and you've never worked with me before um, to uh, speak to me for free. This offer um, will be available for just a few days. Um, and if you click on the link, you can schedule uh, a free 20 minute consult with me. This is a hundred dollar value. Um, like I said, I'm going to open up one day on my schedule for this. And um, 
This is an opportunity where you can ask any pressing health concerns, whether that be yeast overgrowth or some other health challenge. And then I will give you at least one strategy that you can walk away with. Uh, maybe you are just wanting to know how to work with a functional practitioner, what that looks like, and if I'd be a right fit for you. So if you would like to learn more, schedule a free consult by simply clicking on the link on the right-hand side of your screen in the chat box. And uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to answer any questions people have. And I see there, Dorothy, do you recommend starting with the GI map testing and how much is that? Great question. So um, I often do recommend starting with the GI map testing. Um, this is one that um, I really didn't have available to me a few years ago. Um, I did other functional diagnostic tool testing because they were really the best we had at the time. But the technology is certainly improving and it's just, I think, a little bit more sensitive of a test. And the GI map test, um, the cost varies. I personally do not mark up any of my, my labs. And so the GI map test, it depends on whether or not your insurance will cover it, but he, this is what the lab does. Diagnostic Solutions uh, is the lab. And the full cost of the test is $359. And if people have insurance, you we can do with the lab, they'll do what's called a prepay. And the prepay is they will file your insurance and you prepay up front $179 for the lab. Then if the insurance doesn't pay for it, you're responsible for the difference or the full amount, uh, which is the $359. Now, certainly if somebody has a high deductible, I would just say, you know, pay the $359. And, and then another thing that I would say, if in working either with me or doing these tests, it's possible, you know, if you have a health savings account, this is a place you may be able to use that. And certainly when people are working with me and making appointments, they can use flex spending or health savings accounts as well. But that's a really good question. As um, some of you may know, if you've ever worked with a functional practitioner or done any kind of functional medicine testing, the vast majority of these tests are not covered by insurance, um, which is unfortunate um, in some ways because we can glean so much information from some of these types of tests. So um, that's a great question and I'm sure it's one other people have as well. Um, uh, how do you find... How do the finding from the GI map compare to saliva tests? Okay, well, uh, that there's a couple of different things there with those. So the GI map testing is actually looking at DNA markers in the stool. There is a, a saliva test that may pick up immunoglobulin levels in saliva for certain parasites and fungus. So yes, that is available. I would say the GI map test is a step above. It's just a little, going to be a little more sensitive to not only seeing if the a bacteria or a fungus or a parasite is present, but what level of it's present. So when when we look at um, organisms, we look at them in thou hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, and so forth. So we can actually see the degree and numbers, you might say, microscopically as to how much of that DNA is put there. And you're welcome, Dorothy. I appreciate the question. So it's just a different way of looking at things. I think that the um, GI map testing is just more sensitive. There's another test out there called Viome, V-I-O-M-E. Uh, the, there's a bit of a difference between those. So the GI map test is actually going to look at these DNA markers for the stool, parasites, yeast, fungi, etc. The biome testing is actually looking at your microbiome and determining maybe what foods work right for your body based on your microbiome. So they're a little bit different 
in what they do and I and I think sometimes that can be a bit confusing uh, as well but yeah my go-to right now is really doing GI map testing okay does anyone have any other questions this evening well one thing I want to kind of just uh, end with here tonight you know functional uh, medicine professionals you know, as a group, we're a rather passionate group, and we are trained in treating the whole person, not just the illness, and work to create a practitioner-patient partnership that allows you to share your experiences so together we can find a solution. As a functional medicine practitioner, I'm going to personalize your plan that's right for you. So if you've never worked with one and you're wondering, I would encourage you to take me up on that free offer. And, you know, there's a lot that we do behind the scenes in individualizing each person's um, unique plan of care. And I think that's where, um, you know, trying to get that mainstream eyes, I, get, I guess, gets a little bit difficult. Certainly Cleveland Clinic is trying to find a way to do that through group coaching programs. But I think this has to be an integral part of our health care in moving forward if we're going to help people get well. So if you have no, any, uh, no further questions this evening, I want to thank you all uh, for taking the time to be with me this evening. And be sure uh, if you have any other thoughts or concerns, I'd love to see you over at my website, pathtohealthandhealing.com, or would love to have you in the Path to Health and Healing Facebook group as well, where I share lots of information too. So I just want to say thank you all and have a wonderful evening.